The Rabid. Addendum. Written and read for you by Amy Urban. Urban. Addendum to Catastrophic Incident 1005042042, Washington, D.C. This addendum, signed by the Departments of Homeland Security, Defense, and Interior, supports federal efforts in the response to catastrophic incidents as described in the narrative summaries of Incident 1005042042, The Rabid, and Emergency Search and Rescue. To support National Interagency Search and Rescue SAR response efforts following Incident 1005002042, the National Search and Rescue Committee collected and reviewed the contents of this addendum as guidance for federal SAR responders. Please note that the individuals identified in this addendum should not be approached without support. They are to be considered armed and dangerous. On behalf of the National Search and Rescue Committee, Dr. David A. Wood. Classified. Office of Strategic Services, Washington, D.C. FBI, Washington, 9 32 Urgent. At approximately 1950, this office received a telephonic communication that two journals were recovered near Tehachapi, California, following incident redacted. Journal number one contains approximately 300 pages and is hardbound. Source is a Caucasian male, Jack Reynolds, automotive mechanic, 35 years of age. Journal number two contains approximately 400 pages and is softbound in red. Source is a Caucasian female, Lisa Reynolds, doctor of medicine, 33 years of age. Journals being transported to, redacted, by plane for examination. Attached documents are classified secret. Further investigations are being conducted. End. Associated documents, two journals, approximately 114,000 total words in length. Investigative elements of rhabdovirus vaccine and antidote, Possible whereabouts of J. Reynolds and L. Reynolds. Begin summary. Emergency Department Record, Emerald Bluff Hospital, Utah. Patient, Langford, Scott P. Provider, Dr. B. M. D. Date of birth, redacted. Weight, 167 pounds. Height, 5 foot 10 inches. Chief complaint, Harry Solms. Current meds, redacted. Allergies, zombie bites. Source, information obtained from patient. Mode of arrival, gurney. Pre-hospital interventions, none. History of patient illness. Patient is a 20-year-old male who presents with an infected bite on the left bicep. Physician assessment time was redacted. Nursing notes were reviewed and the following are my comments. The onset time was approximately redacted. Patient was bitten by infected individual on left upper arm. Damage to outside tissue is minimal. There is semicircular tissue loss of 3 by 4 centimeters on the left bicep with irregular margins. No other injuries are positive present. Patient experienced physical symptoms of rabies such as hydrophobia and violent muscle spasms. Patient was immediately given the antidote and vaccine followed by shock therapy. Patient has since responded positively to treatment and will likely make a full recovery. No zombification here, y'all. Unknown date, Jack Reynolds. So much blood. It was too hot. The whole bunker was too damn hot. The smell of dried, coagulated blood was overwhelming. It coated the back of my throat with a metallic tang. My mouth was dry. I couldn't swallow. Everything was drenched in red. The shiny white porcelain of the tub was thick with overflowing sludge. Black rivulets of slime cascaded over the linoleum tiles. The walls began to peel. Blood poured from each tear. Not this shit again. I tried to call out, but when I opened my mouth, blood and clots of tissue ran from it in a river. Spongy flesh squished between my teeth, my stomach to lurch. And I think the vomit finally woke me up. I chucked what was left of my dinner into the trash can near the pull-out sofa. It didn't leave easy, either. The violent seizure of muscles tightened my throat as I coughed the rest out in short bursts. Sweat had pooled under my lower back, and when I flopped into bed, the sheets clung to me. My wife stood next to me, then rolled over, placing a hand on my arm. Are you all right? I groaned as I sat up. My body just didn't work like it used to. Propping myself against the cushions, I rubbed my left knee. The bullet wasn't there anymore, but the pain sure was. And for some reason, puking made it worse. I laid my head back. I ate the fucking baby. My voice was hoarse, and I put a hand over my eyes. Again? Mm. 
Sheets rustled next to me as my wife sat up. I can give you a trazodone. She didn't wait for my answer, only reached over to the bedside table for an orange bottle of pills. I nodded without a word, like I was on autopilot, just like almost every other night. She handed me the pill. I looked at the dumb little thing in my hand, stark white against the paleness of my skin. Sweat dripped down my back, tickling my spine. The longer I looked at the pill, the stronger the taste of bile became. Do you need a Zofran, too? I looked at her. There was sincerity and pain in her eyes. No, that's pretty much all out, I said. Flicking my wrist, I popped the pill into the air and caught it. On second thought, I'm done sleeping. I hadn't even realized what time it was until I ventured into the kitchen for a glass of water. Well, kitchen is giving the room too much credit. The little bunker we found only had half a kitchen. A fridge in one corner, a sink, and a toaster oven. That and a lot of canned food. Water was also putting it mildly. What came out of the tap was a pallid yellow, always cold, and tasted stale somehow. But it quenched your thirst and didn't make you shit liquid. It was sickly hot again in that little room. What I wouldn't have given to open the bunker door and let the fresh night air in. A large padlock stared back at me, mocking me. I hadn't been outside in... I pulled my cell phone out of my pocket. The thing hadn't made or received a single call in almost a year. The words no service had been there so long, I worried it would burn into the screen. I wasn't even sure if the date and time were right. A soft noise pulled my thoughts back into reality. I fixed my gaze on the dark living room. And when I say living room, I mean 20-year-old pull-out sofa in dire need of repair in front of a 1970s tube television with those silver rabbit ear antennas. Of course, there was no cable, not even satellite, just a bunch of old movies we'd all seen four times already. Something moved ever so slightly in the dark. I knew I'd sensed it. Someone was awake at two in the morning, and someone who shouldn't have been. My wife had gone into the only bedroom to check on her son, and a moment later, the sliver of light blinked briefly as someone passed in front of the door. I slid some construction paper and a marker across the table to me. The kids had been drawing farm animals all day. A pink, misshapen duck was the only surviving piece of art from that day. Why? I have no idea. The damn thing had four legs. I scribbled my note, then held it up toward the living room. I could tell when Lexi had read my message urging her to go back to bed because she stood up from behind the sofa and halfway into the light. I'm thirsty. Her voice was no more than a whisper. Following a lengthy sigh that felt like I'd unloaded a gravel truck's worth of grief mixed with terror, I nodded, motioning for her to sit with me. She approached slowly, almost as if feeling me out to see if I was going to yell. Jesus, did I have resting bitch face or what? Lexi filled a clean glass with sink water and came to the table. On instinct, she went to her usual seat to my right, but then hesitated. Instead, she chose to sit at a spot at the table typically unoccupied at dinner, farther away from me. She sat down, plopping her full glass in front of her, then crossing her arms. Her brown, kinky hair was pulled up in a bun. There were dark circles under her eyes. No, not dark circles. It was smeared mascara? My back creaked at the sudden straightening of my spine. When the actual ass did Lexi start wearing mascara? My stomach flip-flopped at the thought of my wife piercing her ears last month. A girl her age shouldn't be wearing makeup and getting her ears pierced. Is Aunt Lisa not having the baby anymore? Her somber question snapped me back into reality. She'd always been far beyond her years, but pride never failed to swell in me when her intuition was spot the fuck on. I cleared my throat while pushing a hand through my hair. Before I could open my mouth to speak, she continued. Don't bullshit me. What? Hey, language! Not like I cared. Canned response. Lexi rolled her eyes and took a sip of water. Her nose wrinkled when the taste hit her. Never failed. No. She's not having the baby anymore. I couldn't hide the darkness in my tone. There was a moment's silence. That sucks. She took a large gulp of water. So, are you going to make another one? My head fell to the table where I pretended to bang it twice against the wood. This conversation isn't happening. It so is? A giggle escaped her. What's stopping you from just getting her preggers again? I snapped my head up. Did I have the talk with you? My voice came out way too high. Who had the talk with you? Oh, please. Lexi waved a hand in front of her face. Aunt Lisa had the talk with me way early. Besides, what else could you both be doing all day on Tuesdays when I have to stay in the room? The breath caught in my throat. In that moment, I realized she wasn't the cool little girl I'd met two years ago. 
the cool little girl who asked me to teach her Morse code and the NATO alphabet. The cool little girl who had the patience of a saint when she played with her autistic cousin. The cool little girl who went to Nazi wanted to learn about cars while I worked on them had now transformed into an awesome young woman who was fluent in SOS speak, could change her oil or brakes, and was wearing fucking makeup. Didn't we say no makeup until you were 14? My voice took on a lower tone, almost making up for my high-pitched outburst from before. Lexi tossed her head back and let out a groan. Oh my god, I knew you had no idea what was going on. She looked at me, fire burning behind her dark eyes. My 14th birthday was last month. That's why I wanted Aunt Lisa to pierce my ears, but no. She drew out the word, her eyes rolling to the back of her head for a brief second. You go and flip serious shit, not even realizing how old I actually am. For a second, I couldn't think of anything to say. She was right. I not only forgot her birthday, but I'd forgotten my own. And I acted like a dick the whole day. I'm the asshole. Baby occupied with grief over a baby I never even had. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ on a smoked salmon and cream cheese crudite. How the fuck was I supposed to apologize for that? She sat in front of me then, her cheeks flaming pink, resenting me for not giving a shit about an important day in her life. I'll have you know, my mouth refused to shut itself. I got you a present. It was a pony, but Amazon lost the package. A short pause later and she was breaking up laughing. I let out a breath and a long whoosh, happy I was able to diffuse a tense situation. But it didn't last long. You owe me. Guess I wasn't getting out of that one, but I'm not sure how much I can do. After she downed the rest of her water, the glass slapped back onto the table with a sharp ring. I've been reading about nuclear fallout. Oh, Jesus. Lexi. I put on my dad tone, as she called it. Even if they dropped the largest nuclear bomb right outside of Breakheart, we'd only need to stay here a max of four days and- Lexi! My voice was perhaps louder than I'd intended because she jumped a little and stopped talking, her eyes wide. I've made myself very clear these last few months that I'm not willing to risk everyone's health for a breath of fresh air. Few months? Lexi slammed her hands down on the table, causing the glass to shake. She stood so fast her chair scraped across the tiles, the sound ringing throughout the small kitchen. It's been nine months, 16 days, and four hours. I've counted every second because this place sucks major ass. Slow your roll, Lexi. But she didn't sit down. Her fists clenched and unclenched by her sides. There is zero chance of radiation poisoning, Lexi. Zero chance. And if you don't open that door tomorrow, then I will. We stared each other down for what felt like hours. I wasn't going to concede, but was hoping she would. I couldn't explain why I was right. I just knew it. Radiation sits on the ground for years. Uh, people were still getting cancer in Hiroshima. No, we weren't leaving. But she wasn't backing down. And I knew she'd follow through on what she'd said. No joke. Alexandra Hargrave kept her word. Once she made a decision, there was little anyone could do to change her mind. Fuck. I had to stop her from opening the door. We kept staring each other down like two hungry coyotes fighting for a meal. The thought of food caused my stomach to flip-flop. I'll do it. No, you won't. The screeching of the bedroom door interrupted my command. My wife appeared, stopping in her tracks when she saw Lexi. Oh, there you are. Are you all right? She asked, coming around and smoothing the hair on top of Lexi's head. Yep. She looked back at me, a smug smile pulling at her mouth. Just thirsty. Night, Uncle Jack. I grumbled after her, watching the rectangle of light appear and disappear once more. Then I turned back to Lisa. She padded toward me, wearing a thin robe. I could see the outline of her naked body underneath. A shock of arousal ran through me. She sat opposite me at the small table. Any chance you'd like to talk about it? Her gaze bored into mine. She reached for my hand as she spoke. Oh, why did she have to be so beautiful? So well put together. Why couldn't we just have this child? I sniffed. No. A slight nasally tone laced my words. It's not Tuesday. That was all I could say. It felt curt, but by now she understood. I couldn't talk about it. I could only talk about it once a week without going completely insane. That was Tuesdays, and it wasn't Tuesday. Lisa nodded, a lock of her dark hair falling over one shoulder. Well then. She paused, searching for the right words, no doubt. How about those jets? I felt a smile tug at my mouth. The jets suck, woman. 
She smiled in return, lifting both eyebrows. All sports are violent. All of them can easily kill a person. I don't like them at all. Ditto, I said. At least Sake's improving. My thumb absently stroked the back of her hand. No thanks to you. She stood, a playful smile in her eyes and not on her mouth. I scrunched up my face. Ooh, burn. Oh, she turned back to me. We have ointment for that. I let my mouth drop open comically. Two for one special. It comes with french fries, she said, her eyes still twinkling as she came around the table to me. I watched her move like water, so smooth and enticing. I couldn't help it. I gave her a light smack on the ass. And a milkshake. She tapped my shoulder with one hand as if to scold me. You're insatiable. Humor passed before my eyes. You have no idea. Her hand left my shoulder, making the tiniest swish sound as the fabric of my t-shirt pulled back. But I turned to catch her wrist, pulling her down into my lap. The night wasn't over yet. The tiny washing room was longer than it was wide. With about four feet of clearance on one side, it was almost impossible to fit one person in there, let alone two. And somehow we managed to tumble in. The human libido is a powerful thing, and Lisa and I had to take it when and where we could get it. This mostly consisted of stand-up quickies or the like in the most random of places in case one of the kids walked in. Ow! Wait! Okay, now go... No, this way. I caught Lisa's wrist as the back of her hand was about to make contact with my face. Now you know hitting is only a Thursday night fetish. She giggled, blush creeping into her cheeks. I tightened my grip on her just a bit. There was about an inch of clearance behind me, and Lisa was backed up against the dryer. We were a tangle of legs and arms, just trying to figure out what went where. Lisa shifted her weight, standing on my right foot. Sliding the other away from her, I winced. Catching on, she looked down, gasped, and apologized. Hey, no worries. Uh, kuna Matata. I shot her a smile. Now, how do we... I looked down, trying to figure out the best way to get down to business. Oh, let me. Wedging her arms between us, Lisa finagled her hands down to the waistline of my jeans. Okay, okay, those are attached. Oh, I'm sorry. A sigh escaped me. Okay, enough is enough. I scooped my wife up in my arms, ignoring the fresh bloom of pain from my left knee. She let out a small yelp as I positioned her on top of the dryer. Once she got her bearings, she wrapped her legs around my waist. That's what I'm talking about. She smiled, reaching forward to pull me into a kiss. A nice one at that. Once I was able to get my hands between us, there was nothing else separating me from her except a few layers of cloth. Oh, ow! I stubbed my toe on the leg of the dryer. Are you all right? Her hands were on my chest. I grunted a reply. Ugh. Can you... What? I stopped, rolling my eyes in frustration. I really wish I could see you naked. And I wish I could have a five-minute staring contest with your abdominals. Haha! <laughs> Good one! Instead of laughing, though, I decided my last fuck had deteriorated, so I simply pulled Lisa toward me, ripped off her panties, and unzipped my jeans. When I pushed myself inside her, she let out a gasp that almost sounded painful. You okay? Yes, she said, sounding out of breath already. Don't stop. Uh, okay. I kept going despite the lack of room and the shelving above her coming loose. A bottle of detergent toppled over, spilling a white glittery powder. Grunting, I grabbed it and righted it. Fabric softener and dryer sheets tumbled off the shelf, bouncing off Lisa's shoulder. Instead of letting it get to her, she just reached up behind her and held onto the shelf, rendering it immovable for the duration of our quickie. Okay, wait. She laid a hand on my chest once more, adjusted herself, then peered at me through thick eyelashes. Okay, okay, keep going. Didn't have to tell me twice. And I lasted about six more minutes, which wasn't too bad a record. I've had worse. Toward the end, Lisa let out small hums and gasps of pleasure. The rouge in her cheeks grew rosier with passion until she cried out my name. Shh! I pulled her close to my chest while we both let out a chuckle. You're gonna wake the dinosaur. Rar, she said simply, imitating her own son. 